Major Ian Thomas. And all I want to do this afternoon is to share with you something of the glorious truth that is ours in the Lord Jesus and which we are privileged to pass on to our fellow men. For this is our mission, to make Christ known. What a thrilling and a wonderful thing it is to be a Christian. All that Christ is in all that you are. That's all that it means to be a Christian. Some of you met one of my very dear colleagues, Stuart Briscoe, I believe, in Dallas in the earlier part of this year. In his book, he says the secret of the Christian life is very simple. It is simply to discover why the Lord Jesus is the Lord Jesus, where he is why he is, who he is, where he is. That's the secret of the Christian life. Why he is, who he is, where he is. Well, if we're Christians, where is he? Clothing himself in a very wonderful and unique way with our humanity. <laughs> If you can't hear me, please I'll indicate that fact. Why he is, who he is, where he is. And we're going to explore together something of the essential principles of the Christian life. Take a panoramic view of the message of salvation. Some years ago, it was my privilege to share ministry in a student conference in California at Forest Home with Dr. Bernard Ram, and he enunciated there simple principles that have become increasingly meaningful to me and giving him the credit that is his due. I'd like to reiterate those principles and build upon them. Very simple principles. <laughs> the first principle is this, that the form of Scripture is the word of God. That's the first principle. <laughs> that when we take the Bible in our hands, Old Testament and New Testament, the form of Scripture is the word of God. The word of God. Something that God has said. And everything that God has said is something that God wants you and me to know. And that's the nature of Scripture. The form of Scripture is the Word of God. The second principle that was enunciated was equally simple. If the form of Scripture is the Word of God, then the character of the Word of God is gospel. Whether in the Old Testament or whether in the New Testament, the character of what God has to say and what God wants you to know is gospel. A word very simply that means good news. What God has said and what God wants you to know is good news. It's worth hearing and it's worth proclaiming. That was the second simple principle. The form of Scripture is the Word of God and the character of the Word of God is gospel. And the content of that gospel as a third principle is Jesus Christ. Did you get those three simple principles? The form of Scripture is the Word of God. The character of the Word of God is gospel. And the content of that gospel is Jesus Christ. The gospel, which in the first case is redemptive, and the gospel, which in the second place is regenerated. It's two-sided. 
The Lord Jesus Christ died for me. That's redemption. And rose again to live in me. That's spiritual regeneration. And once I have been presented with those two facts, he died for me to live in me, I'm left with one moral obligation. Let him. And that's what the Bible calls faith. And briefly comprehended, this is the whole counsel of God. For deriving from these principles, everything else arrives that matters. Now, the word, of course, is a means of communication. And the scripture, which according to its form is the word of God, is simply a communication between God and man. And the Lord Jesus Christ is also the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made God, and the Word was God. And this Word was made flesh. And the Lord Jesus himself is the living Word, a means of communication. And that is why you can never detach the Scriptures as the Word of God and as Gospel from the Lord Jesus as the living Word of God and as Gospel. You cannot separate the Scriptures as gospel from Jesus Christ as gospel. The moment you detach the scriptures from the Lord Jesus Christ, the scriptures cease to be either redemptive or regenerative. And the moment you detach the Lord Jesus Christ from the scriptures, Jesus ceases to be redemptive and ceases to be regenerative. Now, this is pathetically possible. You can have a Bible which because it has been detached from the person of Jesus, neither redeems nor regenerates. And you can have a Jesus if you detach him from the revelation given to us of Jesus in the Scriptures, who equally is impotent, neither redemptive nor regenerative. He's just a sentimental counselor, nothing more nor less than that. The gospel, redemptive, and regenerate. In redemption, God provides for you in Jesus Christ the one by whom you have the power to become a child of God. In regeneration, God pre presents to you in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ the one by whom you can be what by redemption you've become. It's important that we should understand this. Redemption gives you the power to become. Regeneration gives you the power to be what you have become. And it's sadly possible to know the Lord Jesus in his redemptive efficacy and through him have the power to become without enjoying day by day the power of the Lord Jesus by his indwelling Holy Spirit and enjoy the power of being what by his atoning death he's given you the right to become. To have the Lord Jesus for less than the one who died for us to live in is to live in self-imposed poverty. In the redemptive purpose of God, he puts you and me into Christ. And that gives us the power to become. It's called justification clothed with his righteousness, God accepts us in the beloved. Because vicariously, 1900 years ago, he was clothed with your sin and with mine. And now God looks at me in Christ. For redemption puts a man into Christ. It's a beautiful expression that we constantly have in the New Testament. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ means that by faith you have entered into the good of God's redemptive act. But of course the thrilling and the wonderful thing is this, that no man can be in Christ without from that moment Christ being in him. Redemption puts you into Christ, but spiritual regeneration puts Christ into you. When you step into Christ, it makes you fit for heaven, for it gives you the power to become a child of God. But 
when Christ steps into you, he gives you the power to be what by redemption you've become. And that makes you fit for earth. The redemption makes you fit for heaven. Spiritual regeneration makes you fit for earth. And in the redemptive act, which was accomplished by his atoning death, there was a regenerative person which was designed to make you that a partaker of that divine nature in whom there is given to you all that pertains to life and God. And of course, it's by redemption it's possible for, for God to look and see you in Christ. By spiritual regeneration, it's now possible for the world to see Christ in you. And that's really the object of the exorcism. Now, these are some very simple principles. But it is equally essential, however simple they may be, that we grasp. That the scriptures in form are the word of God. That the character of that word is gospel and the content of that gospel is Jesus. That the gospel is twofold. It's redemptive, in that it gives you the right to become, and it's regenerative in that it gives you the power to be what redemption has given you the right to become. And of course, if in the redemptive act there is a regenerative purpose, at the end of that regenerative purpose there is a consummating climax. And that consummating climax is enunciated for us in the first epistle of John. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when, we sh when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. That is the consummating climax of the regenerative purpose that is precipitated by the redemptive act. Like that. That's the end product. And this ultimately is what God is at in redemption. When in the first of John in the third chapter, the second verse, we have become like him, where have we got? We've got way back into Genesis chapter 1. The consummating climax simply presents man once more to God in his original image. For the whole purpose of God in redemption and in spiritual regeneration is simply to restore the man to his true humanity. It's to make man man again as God intended man to be. Not, I believe, to inhabit some utopia that is to be established on earth. The Bible leaves us in absolutely no doubt whatever that so far as God is concerned, this world is a total write-off. It's without salvage. Absolutely without salvage. God is calling out a people to himself that on the basis of the redemptive act and by that regenerated process that is precipitated by that redemptive act, might be restored to that image that makes once more uh, an invisible God visible in terms of his humanity. And that, of course, is how alone we may evaluate our own spiritual maturity. Not ultimately by what we know, not ultimately by the office that we may have, not ultimately by the activity in which we may be engaged, but ultimately, the acid test of our spiritual maturity is the measure in which Jesus Christ once more is, to, is able to express his image in terms of our humanity. The measure, in other words, in which we have been restored to that noble, holy function for which man was made. Let us make man in our image. After our life. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. That's the end part. So when salvation has gone full cycle, it is a means whereby God has been able to move man from likeness to likeness. And 
everything that is between man's created likeness and his recreated likeness is what we call gospel. That's gospel. Not just come to Jesus and have your sins forgiven. Not just escape hell and one day get to heaven. Everything between that likeness and image of God in which man was made and that likeness and image of God in which one day when he appears and we see him, we shall be found in his presence. Everything between those two areas of likeness is God. Good news. And nothing less than the end product will ever satisfy the heart of God. The noblest and the holiest ambition that can burn in your heart or mind is that every boy, girl, man or woman, my own children, my own wife, my husband, my family, my friends, my business associates, those who serve me across the counter, shall become compellingly aware in my presence that Jesus Christ is alive and that he's alive in me. Because I have learned now why he is, who he is, where he is. He died for me, redemption, to live in regeneration. And all I've got to do is let him and walk by faith. Now that's the principle. Now, if you'll turn with me to the third chapter of the Epistle to the Galatians. Galatians, chapter 3. We'll see that this principle is clearly enunciated. Eighth verse of the third chapter of the Epistle to the Galatians, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. There was a communication. And the communication, we're told in the 8th of Galatians chapter 3, was by the Scripture. The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached. There was a communication. We'll notice in the 12th chapter of Genesis, that the scripture is equated with the word of God. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Who said that? God. It was what God had to say that he wanted, he wanted Abraham to know. And what God had to say then that he wanted Abraham to know is equated in the 8th verse of the 3rd chapter of the epistle to the Galatians as Scripture. For the form of Scripture is the Word of God, a divine communication from God to man. But that which was communicated by the Scripture as the Word of God was gospel. The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Good news. So that the character of the Word was gospel. Verse 16. Galatians 3. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, singular, which is Christ. So the scripture, according to its form, was the word of God. The character of that word was gospel, and the content of that gospel was Jesus Christ. He said, not unto seeds as of many, but as of one to thy seed, which is Christ. But the gospel that is ours in Jesus 
is redemptive and regenerative. That that is. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse, fine. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That was the redemptive act. This was the vicarious atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. By virtue of which you and I, in spite of our guilt, may become accepted in the beloved. Now in such a, a gathering as we have had in these few days, numbered amongst those of us who are sitting in this auditorium, there may well be men and women of noble intention, of sincere desire and holy ambition. And yet you're not redeemed. And that is why in this particular session this afternoon, I'm laying particular emphasis upon the panoramic view of God's soul, total re redemptive and saving purpose. Because wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be a tragedy if, if somebody were to take part in these meetings and be, be caught up, as it were, onto the tide, the, the swell of the tide, and, and feel the warmth of the fellowship of a company of God's redeemed people, and, and be swept along with a, with a warm sense of enthusiasm and yet fall short of being redeemed? Are you redeemed? Has the gospel in its redemptive aspect become experiential in your life? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the Lord, being made a curse for us. The Bible leaves us in absolutely no doubt that the death of Jesus Christ was not the tragic death of a noble martyr. He didn't drift to disaster was stern business. To this end was he born, and for this cause he came into the world to lay down his life a ransom for me. And the only basis upon which you can know peace with God is upon the basis of his redemptive act. That he hath redeemed us from the curse of the Lord, being made a curse. For, for curse it is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And when God preached the gospel to faithful Abraham, this was the first word of that gospel. It was redemption. It was the means whereby you and I, at enmity with God, through sin, might be at peace with God, as those who undeservedly had been acquitted on the grounds of his vicarious and atoning sacrifice. Are you redeemed? He died for you. Redemption. Let it. That's faith. You say, how do I let it? By exposing your need as a guilty sinner to the adequacy of his atoning death and saying, Lord Jesus, I don't deserve it, but you died for me. My sins are as scarlet, but because of the shed blood upon the cross, they may be as white as snow. Thank you. I take what you give. That's faith. You let it. Lord Jesus, you came into this world as the good shepherd to lay down your life for the sheep. You're prepared to redeem me. You're prepared to present me to the Father as accepted before the Father in you, the beloved. This is exactly and precisely what I want you to do. You died for me, and I want to let you. Is it possible that you, as yet, have fallen short of this Faith response to God's redemptive act in Jesus Christ. What are you going to do about it? Supposing I'm talking to, to somebody here, some man or woman or boy or girl for that matter, supposing I'm talking to, to one of you here and, and you've never received Christ Jesus as your, your Savior. You don't know that you're redeemed. You don't know that your sins are forgiven. It doesn't may be that you haven't known the facts, but you do not at this moment have a vivid, living, vital assurance that all is at peace between your soul and God who made it. What are you going to do about it? Well, the one thing I ask you not to do about it is wait for some kind of after meeting or altar call. Because that would be very stupid. It's a 
crazy idea to my mind that folk have to wait for an after meeting or an altar call or an invitation before they get redeemed. You know the fact? Christ died for you. He has redeemed you from the curse of the Lord, being made a curse for you. All he's waiting for is that you should let him. So if at this moment you know that you've never come to the place of complete and utter assurance of your redemption, at this very moment, while you're still listening to my next sentence, in your heart say, Lord Jesus, as from this moment now, I let you. Wouldn't it be stupid to wait another ten minutes? I'm constantly amazed at the close of meetings sometimes when I speak to an individual and I say, when did you receive Christ as your Savior? And they say, well, I, I don't know that I have. And I say, wouldn't you like to? And they say, yes, with all my heart. And I say, didn't you listen to me as I was speaking in the service? They say, yes. Did you understand what I was saying? Yes. And I can never for the life of me understand why they didn't there and then accept Christ. Isn't it strange? Now, may I encourage you at this very moment, if you have never received Christ as your Redeemer, exactly and precisely where you're sitting now, at this point of time. Say thanks. And know from this moment that Christ is redeemed. Was that the blessing that God promised to Abraham in Isaac? Did you think that redemption through the blood of Christ was the blessing that God promised to Abraham and Isaac? Did you think that? You're wrong. It was certainly part of the gospel. It was part of the good news. But you read on with me in the 14th verse of the third chapter of the Epistle to the Galatians. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That, that, in other words, whatever has taken place in verse 13 is the premise. Whatever has taken place in 13 is simply the essential prerequisite. Whatever has taken place in 13 has simply cleared the debt for what is now to take place in verse 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That's the blessing of Abraham. Redemption, re the redemptive act, the atoning death of Jesus Christ was simply the means to this end. Now that's where, by and large, the church, the true evangelical church of Jesus Christ has broken down. It's because, by and large, effectually, experientially, we've stopped at the end of verse 13 and given only intellectual, theological consent to verse 14. That there is so much spiritual poverty experientially in the lives of those who have been genuinely reconciled to God on the basis of the redemptive act. Because they never saw that in the redemptive act there was a regenerative purpose. Does that term confuse you? Regeneration, regenerative purpose? Sometimes we get so familiar with terms that we use ourselves so often that we forget that to some it may still be confusing. Regeneration, new birth, the imparting by God of a life that you and I by natural birth do not possess. That's regeneration. And it's explained for us in the 14th verse that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ on the basis of his redemptive act that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That was the blessing. That we might receive the Holy Ghost. This is the very heart of the gospel. This is the very dynamic of our faith. This is what makes the Christian life a practical working proposition. That on the basis of that redemptive act, because he was made a curse for us upon the cross of Calvary, we now being reconciled to God as those who have embraced redemption by faith in him might receive the Holy Ghost and our redeemed humanity be inhabited by his deity in the person of his other self. For he died for me to live. And my moral responsibility is to... 
I've got to know why he is, who he is, where he is. By his gracious Holy Spirit, the moment that you are redeemed, Jesus Christ comes to take up residence within your humanity. And you know why he does it? Because the end product of this regenerative purpose in the redemptive act is a consummating triumph. Like You see, God made man with the noble office in his humanity of making an invisible God visible. That's a basic principle. For no man has seen God at any time. But a second basic principle is this, that it is only God in a man who can be the origin of his own image. That our likeness, our god like that image of God that, it is, that is to be demonstrated in terms of our humanity is not the consequence of our ability to imitate God or imitate Jesus Christ. That the likeness of God and the likeness of the Lord Jesus in terms of our humanity derives from the exercise of his dominion in the area of human personality. That it is only as the Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign in the area of my thinking, sovereign in the area of my emotions, and sovereign in the area of my will, will his nature be transformed into human behavior. And what happened when man fell into sin? In the day that man believed the devil's lie and repudiated the basic, basic principle of humanity that it takes God to be a man, as God intended man to be, the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the human spirit and all that God had in mind when he sent his son to die upon the cross was that on the basis of redemption, the cleansed, forgiven, acquitted sinner might have restored to him all that it takes to be a Christian. Christ. That's exactly, precisely, all that it takes to be a Christian. Christ. Because, you see, it takes God to be a man, and that's why it takes Christ to be a Christian, because Christ, in the Christian, puts God back into the man. That's the gospel. It takes God to be a man. That's why it takes Christ to be a Christian. Because Christ, in the Christian, puts God back into the man. He died for you. To live in you. Let him. Now, why did Paul write this epistle? As a correction. As a correction. For he was writing this epistle to those who had entered by faith into the redemptive efficacy of the death of Christ, but had completely missed the point. Completely missed the point. They were cheating Jesus Christ of that for which his blood was shed. His right in the power of his resurrection, in the person of his Holy Spirit, to occupy, monopolize, and dominate their humanity. So what was the result? Having received the Holy Spirit as the instant and inevitable seal of their redemption, they proceeded then totally to ignore his presence. And reading from the Amplified New Testament, And in the third chapter of this epistle to the Galatians, the words with which this particular chapter opens, the apostle writes, Oh, you poor and silly and thoughtless and unreflecting and senseless Galatians. That's the amplified New Testament. But not unfairly or unduly amplified. What he said was all of that. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as a result of obeying the law and doing its work? In other words, is the presence of God, the Holy Ghost, now within you resident, the consequence of your deserving, the consequence of your own self-effort, the consequence of your own righteousness? It was a rhetorical question, and he knew perfectly well they knew the answer to that question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as a result of obeying the law and doing its works, or was it by hearing the message of the gospel and believing it? 
Then you perfectly well that if ever the Holy Spirit had been restored to their human spirit and they were no longer spiritually destitute of that divine content that makes man man, God, it was by faith alone in the grace of God. So he goes on to say this, verse 3, Are you so foolish and so senseless and so silly? having begun your new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit, having the God-imparted life. Are you now reaching perfection by dependence on the flesh? The end product of your redemption, which is the consummating climax of that regenerative process, can never be accomplished in the energy of the flesh. You have been redeemed through the death of Christ that you might be inhabited by the life of Christ in the person of his Holy Spirit to share his resurrection. So that Jesus Christ in you might once more become the origin of his own image, the source of his own likeness, and the dynamic of all his own demands. And the foolish, stupid, senseless, silly Galatians, having been redeemed through the blood of Jesus, were living in self-imposed poverty. Living as New Testament Christians in pre-Pentecostal poverty instead of post-Pentecostal plenitude. Now, I asked you just a moment or two ago whether you were quite certain you had entered into the redemptive efficacy of the death of Christ, whether this part of the gospel had really become experiential. May I ask the greater number of those who are gathered here this afternoon, are you absolutely certain that you're not as senseless and stupid and as silly as the Galatians? Are you quite sure? Are you quite sure that you haven't looked upon, as your, uh, upon your conversion as the totality of that part of your salvation in which Jesus Christ is involved? Are you quite sure? Are you quite sure that you haven't been living in a concept of the Christian life that dismisses Jesus Christ from the moment you've put your hand up a meeting or walked to the front or walked the aisle or stayed in some after meeting and claimed redemption through his death? Now you've dismissed him. He's done his part. He has redeemed you. He's paid the price. Your sins are forgiven. You're on the way to heaven and he can get there and wait for you. Are you quite sure? Now be honest with yourself. Has this been the concept of your Christian life till now? that he has done his part, you know the Jesus who was, he's now relegated to heaven, and to you now he's the Jesus who will be, and in the meantime you live in a spiritual vacuum, and you do not know by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit the day-by-day dynamic, the explosive, spontaneous expression of the life of the Jesus who is. And you wonder why your Christian life is flat, and impotent, and powerless, and makes no impression. I want to tell you this, that the Jesus that I know is not the Jesus who was, nor the Jesus who will be. He's the Jesus who is. He is the eternal I am. And the reason that he died for you was that he might live in you, and you are to let him. And this is gospel. This is gospel. This is a gospel meeting. Right now. Because everything between the likeness in which man was created and that likeness in which he will be consummated in the presence of Jesus Christ, everything between likeness and likeness is gospel. And the content of that gospel in redemption and in spiritual regeneration is Jesus Christ. 24 hours in every day. Now, I'm not sure that that isn't where we shouldn't finish for this session. May I just recapitulate? The form of Scripture is the Word of God. God's communication to man, something that God has said that he wants you to know. That's that's the Scripture. The form of Scripture is the Word of God. The character of the Word of God is gospel. A gospel is our good news that is not only redemptive that gives you the power to become a child of God, but regenerative that by the presence of Christ gives you the power to be what by redemption you now have the right to become. Gospel. 
And the content of that gospel, the one by whom you have the right to become and the one by whom alone you have the power to be what you've become, that content of that gospel is this. And that is why you can never at any time detach your Christianity from Christ. For the moment you detach your Christianity from Christ and reduce it to a formula, a pattern superimposed upon you of certain Christian exercises in which you are engaged, however noble and lofty they may be, church going, witnessing, preaching, Tithing, all these things can become, as we have already been so vividly reminded, nothing more than a ritualistic reminder of something that has ceased to be reality. And the moment you do that and detach your Christianity from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got nothing but a dead religion hanging around your neck. May God preserve us, therefore, from being stupid, senseless, silly, and enable us by faith, the faith that lets him enter into all the good of his redemptive death and that regenerative process whereby for every step we take, we share his life in the power of his resurrection until that day that we see him. Seeing him, we are like him. Now let's bow our heads in prayer. Our God, we bless and praise thee for such a wonderful salvation. We thank thee for this good news, and we thank thee for the one in whom this good news was brought to its fulfillment, by whose obedience we have been reconciled. And loving Lord, we trust thee by thy gracious Holy Spirit to minister to the hearts of each one of us. We know that thou dost not witness to men nor honor men, thou dost witness the truth and honor Christ. If there were boy, girl, man or woman who entered this building this afternoon unaware of redemption, without that rich assurance of sin's forgiveness, we trust that already they may be witnessing and joining the evidence that only the Holy Spirit can give to their spirits that a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing has happened. They've been redeemed. And in the measure, dear loving Lord, in which we have discovered that claiming redemption, we have been cheating thee of that for which thy blood was shed seeking to be made perfect in the energy of the flesh instead of living in the fullness of thy resurrection life. Bring us to the place of total capitulation that gives to thee utter monopoly in every area of human personality. And we ask it for thy name's sake. Amen. I'd like to ask for our panelists, if they would, to come forward. I'd like to introduce them, and then we'll uh, get right at the matter at hand, unless there's something I've missed. On uh, my left, your right, Wayne W. Watts. Wayne O. Watts, I'm sorry. Wayne is uh, an oil man from Wichita Falls, Texas. Next to him is Major W. Ian Thomas uh, from England. Next to him is uh, Dr. W. David Stewart, uh, who specially is otolaryngology in Oklahoma City. And before we start, Wayne, would you take the hand mic and commit this time to the Lord? Lord, you've told us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, to let a request be made known unto you. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall be ours through Christ Jesus. Lord, this hour is your hour. We pray that we might be empty of self and filled with thy spirit, that your will might be done and said in our hearts and minds, and the time would be redeemed.